Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started. Um, so if you have any questions during this, please use the chat box to all panelists, and we will be sure to answer them. I am Erin Pollard, and I'm the Project Officer for ERIC in the U.S. Department of Education. I'd like to welcome you to our ERIC Update webinar. Today we are going to talk about ERIC's accomplishments in 2015 and give you a preview of what to expect in the coming year. 2015 was a great year for ERIC. The education community and general public used ERIC heavily. Overall, we had 12 million people from 242 countries resulting, use ERIC, and that resulted in more than 42 million website page views. Here are some highlights about our collection, sources, and key products and services over the past year. ERIC is known for its extensive collection of education-related resources. We've been providing access to the literature and education since 1966 and have indexed nearly 1.6 million journal articles, reports, and other resources. In 2015, we added more than 48,000 new records to the collection, including over 36,600 36, peer-reviewed materials. Of this peer-reviewed materials, more than 11,600 of them have full text available for download. This is an increase of 238% since last year, and it is a huge success for ERIC. We're going to be talking more about the latest ERIC content a little bit later in the presentation. We'll also talk more about the sources that provide content to ERIC, including our journal and gray literature publishers and our individual authors. ERIC currently indexes material from 1,821 active sources, and we added 87 new sources in 2015. These new sources include 59 new journals and 28 new publishers of reports, conference papers, or other documents. In addition, last year, Institute of Education Sciences grantees, or IES grantees, contributed 80 peer-reviewed full-text reports as a result of the IES public access policy. Here's a snapshot of the products and services that ERIC provides. Overall, in 2015, ERIC users downloaded more than 6 million full-text documents from the collection. Users made more than 3,800 inquiries to the ERIC Help Desk. If you haven't used the Help Desk before, simply go to the Contact Us area of the ERIC website and either call or send us an email. We'll be happy to respond. We updated the ERIC thesaurus last year to add new descriptors and update existing terms. In addition, we published two videos. One video is designed for all users, and the other specifically has an audience of IES grantees and contractors. You can find both of these videos on our multimedia page. We also gave presentations at two major library conferences, the American Library Association's annual conference and the annual conference of the Special Libraries Association. And we held two webinars, including a webinar on the Eric Thesaurus and another on our proposed changes to the ERIC selection policy. The webinars and presentations can also be found on our multimedia page. We also had a major update to the ERIC selection policy that was released at the very end of 2015. Some of you may have attended the town hall webinar we held on this topic last year and weighed in on our proposed changes to the policy. The revised policy is now live on the ERIC website. We'll give you some more information about this shortly. We are also excited about a new infographic that we just released that helps explain how articles are added to ERIC. You'll see this infographic and hear how research gets added to the collection a little bit later in the presentation. So to begin, who uses ERIC? While ERIC is designed to be a U.S.-based resource, about half of our users are based outside of the U.S. In a typical month, we see users from nearly every country in the world. This presents an interesting challenge because we want to design our resources to fit the needs of American users, but also be responsive to global needs. When we think about our users, we think about four distinct groups with four different sets of needs. First, we have academics. These are defined as librarians, students, researchers, and faculty that are based in a college or university. This user group often needs high quality research and has access to subscription databases where they can get full text articles if ERIC can't provide the full text. The second audience is educators. This audience typically has little to no access to subscription databases, but they still need access to high quality research that can inform practice. The third group that we focus on is the general public. 
These are parents and community members that are often looking for more general, easy to understand resources, and they rarely have access to full text databases. Finally, we serve policymakers, such as boards of education or legislators. These individuals need information quickly and are often looking for free full text. We think of these user groups equally as we form our collection priorities and develop our services. So that's who uses ERIC, but what is in ERIC? ERIC gets its content from journal publishers, gray literature providers, and individual authors. Gray literature providers contribute a variety of reports, conference papers, and other materials to ERIC. They are made up of education associations, universities, research centers, and other organizations in the field of education. We also get content from federal and state government agencies, including the Institute of Education Sciences. The smallest category of providers are individual authors, including IES grantees and contractors, who submit their work to ERIC via our online submission system. Last year, ERIC selected 59 new journals and 28 gray literature sources from a large pool of candidates for indexing. We gave priority to peer-reviewed materials that are releasable in full text, either immediately or after an embargo. As you've heard, we've been prioritizing these resources. With the addition of these publishers, ERIC now has 1,017 journal publishers and 804 gray literature sources. If there are new publishers you would like us to see added into ERIC, please contact the ERIC Help Desk via the Contact Us link in the footer of the ERIC website. We will add them to our list for future review. All of the agreements led to individual pieces of content or ERIC records. Overall, ERIC added 48,097 records in 2015. That's slightly more than 4,000 a month. Our content mix is largely made up of journal articles, reports, conference papers, other documents, and books. As you can see on the chart, the largest group of records at 52% is the peer-reviewed content where we cannot display the full text. The majority of these records are peer-reviewed journal articles that we don't have permission from the publishers to display in full text. Next at 24% is peer-reviewed full text content. This category includes peer-reviewed journal articles that we have permission to provide in full text and IES reports. This has been a key area of the collection that we have been trying to build, so we are really pleased with this number. The two smallest categories are the documents that aren't peer-reviewed where we cannot display the full text at nearly 16%, and the documents that are not peer-reviewed but we can display the full text at 8%. These are mainly reports from nonprofits, conference papers, and the like. So let's compare this update with a look at the content added into ERIC in 2011. Here are two pie charts that show a comparison of the mix of work that we added to ERIC in 2015 versus the mix that we added in 2011. The percentage of full-text content that is not peer-reviewed has remained fairly cons constant at 7 and 8 percent, but there were large shifts of all other content areas. We added less of the no full-text and peer-reviewed content in 2015, but note a very large change in the percentage of full-text peer-reviewed content added in 2015 versus the amount added in 2011, more than 260 percent more. We have worked really hard to build this part of the collection to serve the needs of our non-academic users, the ones without access to subscription databases that still need high quality research. Speaking of full text as a huge part of the value that Eric brings to the user community, we are very excited to let you know that the College Board has asked Eric to become the official repository for all of its full text content. We are now in the process of acquiring and indexing all of their content that we don't already have available in the collection, and they will be linking to the PDFs in ERIC instead of on their website. So in 2015, peer-reviewed full text content was a quarter of the new records, but when you look at how this compares to the whole collection, only 2% of our records are peer-reviewed full text. Because ERIC has been in existence for over 50 years and has nearly 1.6 million records, it takes a good bit of effort to shift the collection. When you look at the breakdown of the rest of the collection, you will see that we are indexing about the same amount of peer-reviewed work where we cannot display the full text and less non-peer-reviewed work that we cannot display the full text. We've also dis 
decrease the amount of non-peer-reviewed full text. And we're trying to replace some of that content with peer-reviewed content instead. So that's our collection as it stands today. However, it raises questions about how does that content get into ERIC? We've heard questions from users like, does ERIC take everything that publishers send to them? And what happens if I submit my paper to ERIC? Will ERIC perform a peer review of my work? To respond, we created an infographic that will help users, that will help clarify our processes from the beginning to the end of the content workflow. So now I'm going to turn over the presentation to Dave Brady, who directs the ERIC contract at AEM Corporation. He's going to talk about the processes for how new records get added to ERIC. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, I'm going to use the new infographic to give you a behind-the-scenes view of the inputs and processes involved with adding records to the collection. We've split the infographic into two pieces to make it a bit easier to see the text associated with each of the processes. This slide in front of you now shows the top half of the infographic, which depicts our source identification and selection processes. The next slide contains the bottom half of the infographic, which depicts our content acquisition, record processing, and online collection updating steps. So let's start with the yellow box on the top right of your screen. This box shows our largest source of potential new content for ERIC, and that is recommendations for journals and other news sources to be added to the collection. These recommendations come from publishers, ERIC users, and members of the ERIC team, and we typically get between 25 to 50 recommendations each month. Most of these recommendations come from publishers, and in recent years we've seen an increase in the number of international publishers asking to have their journals indexed in ERIC. So after we receive a recommendation for a new source, then what? The first step is to conduct a high-level review to see if the source is within ERIC's scope. We do this initial review because many of the recommendations that we, re that we receive are for sources that are not education-related. For example, about 50% of the suggestions we receive are for journals in other disciplines, such as psychology, medicine, or engineering. Another part of this initial review is determining if the sources are published in English. If a source is education-related and published in English, it moves to the next stage for further consideration. Now let's move over to the yellow box on the top left of your screen. These are inputs we receive from individual authors through the online submission system. These materials tend to be conference papers and reports and also include funded research submitted by IES grantees and contractors. On occasion, we receive journal articles from sources that are not currently indexed in ERIC. These submissions sometimes help us become aware of new journals that we may want to consider as potential sources in the future. These top two yellow boxes represent the key inputs to the next stage in the process, which is known as source selection. During the source selection process, we screen materials to determine if they are appropriate for ERIC, and we do this screening using the ERIC selection policy. Broadly speaking, the review against the selection policy ensures that each selected source is relevant to one or more of the topic areas in the IES authorizing legislation and is education research. There are other criteria that we also consider, and if you'd like more information on the selection policy, you can go to the footer on any of the pages in the web, on the ERIC website to find more information on the selection policy. Online submissions pass through the selection process as soon as they are uploaded, and ERIC notifies authors if their materials are not accepted. Online submissions that are accepted are represented by the yellow box on the left side of the screen and go into the processing step, which I'll describe on the next slide. Recommendations for new sources are reviewed twice per year, as you can imagine, there's a significant list of recommendations, and therefore we're not able to review them all in a single review cycle. Sometimes we prioritize our reviews of sources based on our collection priorities at the time. Publishers that are selected for ERIC sign an agreement to have their content indexed in the system, and this step is represented by the middle yellow box. This agreement specifies if ERIC is allowed to display the full text of the article, either immediately or after an embargo period, or whether the document can be accessed on a publisher website. The final yellow box on the bottom right notes that sources that are not consistent with the selection policy may be held for a future review. Now let's move to the next steps of, in the process. So we've covered the source identification and selection processes. Now we're going to move on 
to the bottom part of the infographic, which shows our content acquisition, record processing, and online collection updating steps. The publisher agreement that we mentioned on the previous slide also specifies how Eric will acquire the content acquire the articles and other content for indexing. This providing of content is depicted in the top yellow box on the slide. Some publishers upload their content to an ERIC FTP site, others email it, and a number of publishers make their content available on their own website, and we have ERIC staff go download from their websites. Coming in via the yellow arrow on the top left of your screen are the approved online submissions from the prior slide. These online submissions are directly uploaded from the submission system located on the ERIC website. The brown building in the middle contains the high-level steps associated with taking the publisher content and online submissions and processing them. The ERIC team takes this content and creates searchable bibliographic records. Processing these records takes skilled hands and many steps. Our information specialists add the title, author, and other source information about the material to the record into specified fields following our established guidelines. As needed, they also will write an abstract for the article if no abstract is provided by the author or publisher. These abstracts accurately capture the content of the material, and approximately 15% of each month's content requires creation of an abstract. Next, indexers on the ERIC team review the subject matter of the content to apply descriptors from the ERIC thesaurus to the record. These descriptors increase discoverability and allow searchers to find the content that most closely matches their interest. As appropriate, indexers will also add identifiers to augment search results. And we'll talk more about identifiers later in the webinar. After all the metadata elements have been added, our quality control personnel review the ERIC records to ensure that the fields are properly populated and the descriptors and identifiers are relevant to the subject matter. These processing activities produce the 4,000 records each, each month that are forwarded to the Department of Education for updating in the ERA collection, as depicted in the box at the bottom of your screen. Now I'll turn it over to Aaron to tell you more about changes to the ERA selection policy. Thanks, Dave. If you would like to download this infographic that we've had up on the previous slide, you can find it as the first FAQ on our FAQ page in the footer. So now that we've covered a high-level overview of how a record gets added into ERIC, we are going to go a little more into detail on a few updates that we've made to certain parts of the process. Earlier this month, we posted a major revision to the ERIC selection policy. When we were considering the possible changes to the policy, we reached out to ERIC users in our advisory group to gather their input on the proposed changes. We posted a call for feedback on the ERIC website and held a town hall meeting with interested ERIC users. Our advisory group provided their input in a conference call in October, and after considering all feedback, we revised the policy. It's now posted on the ERIC website in the selection policy link in the footer. We've talked about this in previous webinars, but for those of you who are not in attendance, by far, the biggest change to our selection policy relates to how we flag peer review on ERIC records. The new peer review criterion adds a definition of the review process ERIC will accept in order to apply the peer review designation on a record. Acceptable review processes include blind peer review and expert peer review. The policy also extends the peer review flag to all qualified gray literature content which is defined as non-journal content like conference papers and reports. This is by far the most significant change of all. But the policy also defines how we apply the status to approved sources and online submissions. For journals, we apply the peer review designator at the journal level to all records created for the source. For non-journal sources, we may assign the designator, designator to a specific peer-reviewed series or type of publication like conference papers, where we have proof of a peer review process. Work submitted by Institute of Education Sciences, or IES grantees and contractors, is all peer reviewed, so the status is automatically assigned. Other authors submitting peer reviewed work through the online submission system must provide proof that their work went through an acceptable peer review process. So why make this change? Before the revised policy went into effect, Eric flagged peer-reviewed journal content and also extended this flag to some types of gray literature records, 
such as IES publications and other grant fee funded work, but not other grant literature. This created user confusion and we wanted to provide the most complete and accurate information possible. We also wanted to apply the flag in a fair and equitable way across all types of qualified content. This meant we had to develop a clear policy. Also, when we look for new sources to add to our collection, we give preference to sources that publish peer-reviewed content because we believe that users find great value in these materials. By extending our definition of peer review, we are now able to expand this priority to the highest quality gray literature materials our users most want to use. So what will be the impact of these changes? We forecast that we may be able to add the peer review indicator on approximately 100 new peer reviewed sources a year. The majority of these will be conference papers and government sponsored reports. However we, however, we expect the new policy will have a broader implication. Eric will continue to build upon its tradition of high quality gray literature and elevate the status of gray literature in the field. During a review cycle, if we find a gray literature source has a peer review process, then that source will receive the same collection priority as a peer review journal. If you want to learn more about the background surrounding this change to the ERIC peer review policy, see the two archived webinars in the multimedia area of the site, changes to the selection policy in the ERIC town hall meeting. We also made a couple of other changes to the ERIC selection policy that are worth mentioning here. For example, we incorporated our working policy related to multi-language journals to add clarity for international publishers. Our policy is that a journal must have at least 80% of its articles written in English in order to be indexed in ERIC. Additionally, the publisher must provide us with the full text so our indexers can verify the language of its articles. We also added a preservation policy, which responds to questions and requests we have related to removing records or content from ERIC. It is our policy to, extend, to index records in perpetuity. We do not remove content from the collection except for in extreme circumstances, such as claims of plagiarism or social security numbers in a full text document. In addition, to a, in addition a major selection policy update to the major selection policy update, we also made a thesaurus update. The thesaurus is the backbone of ERIC. It's how we index our content. We updated it this past October to capture changes in the terminology, outdated words, and new concepts. We wanted to make sure that this is a valuable resource and that it remains useful, current, and relevant for ERIC users. When we updated the thesaurus, we worked with a pool of candidate terms that have been suggested by ERIC users and indexers. As we review these terms, we asked, is there a literary warrant? Literary warrant means that the term appears in ERIC content. Terms with a high level of literary warrant, a thousand hits or more, are considered to be priorities. Second, is there a need? If we've received multiple requests for the same edition or change, we will consider these requests to be more of a priority than those without multiple requests. Although we cannot select every request for further development, we never get rid of any requested terms. All requests are kept and examined the next time we do it at the source update. We also take into account if the change promotes index inconsistency and reflects the language of our users, as well as bringing our thesaurus into compliance with NISO standards. Given the care and consideration that goes into an update, it took us nearly a year to develop the final changes. In this update, we added 19 new descriptors. Here are some examples, including common core state standards and low-income students. We also added 28 new synonyms and made 17 changes to existing terms, including making the change from mental retardation to intellectual disability. A full list of updated terms is available by browsing this thesaurus on the ERIC website. To learn more about the thesaurus, see the video of the webinar in the multimedia area. The video provides background information on how we update the thesaurus and a description of the update process. If you'd like to download the updated source file, go to the ERIC download area or browse the source on the website. So that's what we've accomplished in the past year. And as you can tell, we've been really busy. So in addition to our ongoing work, we've started some new and exciting projects for 2016. These include our project to restore unreadable PDFs, improvements we're making to the ERIC identifiers field, 
and hyperlinks we are adding to provide more added value for our users. Dave is going to provide us more information on each of these products. Thanks, Aaron. We've started a new project to begin restoring PDFs that were taken offline a number of years ago because they were unreadable. You may have seen these documents in the collection as they're marked with a uh, indicator of PDF pending restoration. We are converting these documents to make them searchable and we have begun returning them online. However, this is not a quick nor straightforward activity and I'm going to provide some more insights into that over the next few slides. And the, the main reason for that is the quality of some of the documents that we're trying to restore. To understand some of the challenges associated with this, it's helpful to remember that when ERIC was created 50 years ago, it was primarily a microfiche, microfiche based system. When ERIC went online, the microfiche was converted to PDFs to make it easy for users to access documents. However, the technology for PDFs 10 plus years ago was different than it is today, and the PDFs were made as images. This means that they were not machine readable, which enables searching and is ideal for individuals with disabilities. To make the documents searchable, Eric used software called Optical Character Recognition, also known as OCR, to scan the PDFs. This process takes the existing image, which you can see on the left-hand part of your screen, and then assigns letters, numbers, or punctuation to it to create a readable layer of text that a user can search, copy, and paste. The text created by the OCR process is known as alternate text. The OCR process works really well for a crisp document, like the one that you would type in Microsoft Word and then print on a laser printer and then go through the OCR process, but many of the historic PDFs were not crisp. Let's look at some of these examples of less crisp documents. Again, it's important to remember that a large number of Eric's historic documents were often typed on a typewriter, converted to microfiche, and then converted to PDF. And as many longtime Eric users may have seen, many of these documents were pretty hard to read with a human eye. And machines, via the OCR process, could not do much better. Some documents are so faint that they are not readable to the human eye, nor via the OCR process and therefore those are not a focus of the current effort to restore unreadable PDFs. Other documents are in better shape and can be processed, but they usually have words that are misspelled, truncated, or missing letters. In this example, which is one of the clearer documents being processed, you can see that there are some issues such as stray markings on the image which make it difficult to read and impact the accuracy of the OCR process. The OCR process created the alternate text shown but this alternate text is not entirely accurate and therefore requires manual editing to make it readable. Manual editing involves correcting text and punctuation to match the image. Making these manual edits can be challenging. We don't want to infer what the author is saying and inadvertently change the alternate text associated with the document. In the example you see here, it's fairly easy to edit some of the alternate text by comparing it with the image. For example, the words legislation, distinction and between are clear in the image so we can accurately edit the alternate text. Where we run into issues is with words that are partially or wholly obscured or have missing letters. We could infer, infer a word but the risk is that it may not be the right word. We're sensitive to the fact that many of these documents are copyrighted materials and that we need to preserve the true meaning of the text. The benefit of making edits when it's impossible when it's possible to interpret the text is that we obtain a readable layer that will help users to search the full text. That way users are more likely to find the information that they're looking for. Now let's look at an example which is a bit more difficult to address. In this example the document contains text that's very difficult for the OCR process given the stray markings and marks in the margin. In this case you can see that basically the alternate text bears some semblance to the text in the image but a very significant portion would have to be corrected or retyped in order to properly reflect the text and punctuation in the document. Given the challenges that, that exist in such records, restoring the PDFs to be readable is a time-consuming process. We're combining the use of manual edits and reviews and automated tools to make the restoring of these previously unreadable documents as efficient and timely as possible. These efforts are part of an incremental effort to be performed over a number of years to restore these historical documents 
as we believe there's great value in bringing as many as possible back into the collection. Now let's shift from the PDF restoration activities over to the ERIC identifiers. A second project that's underway is work that we've been doing with the one of the less known treasure troves of information within ERIC, which is the identifiers field. In order to talk about this work, let's start with some background information, beginning with defining what identifiers are. Identifiers are proper nouns that are assigned to ERIC records to provide greater indexing specificity. Identifiers are search aids that help users find information about geographic locations, such as major cities, states, or countries, laws, such as the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, and measures, such as tests and assessments. Currently, all identifier information is in one field that was made searchable in 2015. However, this year, we're going to break apart this field into three separate fields to make it more searchable and useful. Specifically, having three separate fields will allow more precise searching, make it possible to refine search results using identifiers the same way you can with descriptors, sources, and other ERIC fields today, and lastly, help us improve the rigor and consistency of the identifiers as a controlled vocabulary. We think these searchable fields will be a huge benefit for researchers. Here you can see some examples of how identifiers can be helpful in searches. Identifiers can be combined with search terms, as is shown in the first example, where the search term reading is combined with the identifier, the geographic location identifier, Tennessee. The second search example would return all documents that have Florida Comprehensive Assessment Test as a test and measure identifier. And the last example shows how you can combine the use of multiple identifiers to find specific documents. In this search example, you would find records containing the test and measure identifier associated with Woodcock Johnson and the geographic location identifier, Indiana. One key aspect of improving the identifiers fields is improving the data associated with them. To achieve this, we're going to be standardizing the values associated with identifiers. Again, it's important to keep in mind that ERIC is over 50 years old, and there have been changes over the years in naming conventions and the way identifier terms have been assigned to records. As a result, we now sometimes have a field with different terms for the same entity, making it difficult to find all records. We are taking steps to standardize the language so it's possible to locate everything in ERIC related to a particular term, such as the Higher Education Act in this example. In this example, you'll see three variations appearing in the ERIC identifier field relating to the Higher Education Act. Higher Education Act, Higher Education Act of 1965, and Higher Education Act 1965. Today, in order to find all records about this act, you would have to search using all three terms. To address these types of situations, we will be standardizing identifier values by finding values that have similar names and then ultimately replacing them with standardized terms. We will use software tools to help us develop lists of all identifiers used in ERIC records that either contain or closely resemble similar terms, such as those associated with Higher Education Act. We will then manually review each of these similar terms and provide recommendations to the Department of Education regarding which of these existing identifiers should be mapped to a list of standardized terms. After approval of the mappings of these terms, we'll use software to update the appropriate ERIC records to populate the new identifier fields with standardized terms. The result of these efforts will be a more standardized and less redundant list of identifiers and improved ERIC records. We're also taking additional steps to improve the usefulness of the values contained in the geographic location identifier. One such action is adding consistency to how U.S. cities are identified. In the past, multiple standards have been applied to how U.S. cities were tracked in identifiers, ranging from including the city name as a standalone value, as shown in the example above where Philadelphia is noted, not indicating a city name, and using a construct of indicating the name of the state of the city followed in parentheses by the city name itself. Our approach will be to use the format of state name followed by city name in parentheses as indicated on the slide. We will therefore find all examples of Philadelphia in the identifier, identifier listings of ERIC records and put them into this new format to provide greater standardization and improve searching. 
A second improvement is to improve, eliminate regional references in the identifiers used for states. For example, we currently have records that include identifiers that specify regions within states, such as Alabama Northeast and Arizona South. Given that there can be multiple interpretations regarding what comprises Northeast Alabama, we'll be replacing such identifiers with the identifier for the relevant state. This will provide greater consistency and a broader range of records that searchers can obtain the information that they are seeking. A third project has to do with adding hyperlinks to ERIC records, and now I'll turn it back to Aaron to tell you more. Thanks, Dave. As we worked to fully make ERIC an Institute of Education Sciences investment, we've tried to find ways to add information to records that is useful to our users, keeping in mind the different audiences that I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation. We've identified three new fields that we think will be especially useful. They involve linking to sections of the IES website that is currently under design, but these particular pages we think will be really useful. The first example is adding direct links to the IES website, just like how we have for many other records. And these direct links will allow users to view the publication page for each record. And this page, these pages may have companion reports and supplementary, supplementary materials for the product. For example, this is a toolkit created by the Regional Educational Laboratory Southwest. Eric just indexes the toolkit, but with the link, users will get 31 handouts and 23 videos. Four of these videos summarize the recommendations for evidence-based best practices for teaching, and then the remaining videos show teachers putting in the recommendations into practice in actual classrooms at three different grade levels. This is a fantastic resource that we think Eric users will really appreciate a link to. The second example is providing a link to What Works Clearinghouse practice guide pages. Here you will find videos where you can hear from the author and then download different versions of the report for different audiences. Again, these materials are valuable and we think that giving users a direct link to these materials will be beneficial. A second type of link we are adding is linking to the summary of the grant funding. This is part of the current grant funding page and it gives information about the year, the amount of grant, the purpose, and an abstract. This is really helpful for policymakers and the general public to see what their taxpayer dollars are funding. The last set of hyperlinks we are adding are to a new page that is not currently live, but what it does is it summarizes a What Works Clearinghouse review of a study. The What Works Clearinghouse review studies and the research on different programs, products, and practices, and policies in education, and provides ratings on whether studies provide credible evidence based on the design of the study and whether or not it meets the standards that the What Works Clearinghouse has established. During this process, the WWC produces study review guides with information about the population that the study is focused on, the design of the study, and if there are any methodological concerns with the study. There's a ton of information in these guides that will be tremendously valuable to researchers and students and will all be directly linked to from ERIC. This will enable novice users to know if the evidence presented in the study is rigorous enough to base decisions off of and will enable more advanced users to have all the tools needed to get a summary of the impact of the findings of the study. We are really excited about this resource and think that it will be a tremendous help to users. So that's what we've worked on in the past year and are working on going forward. And now we'd like to take any questions that you have. Please use the chat box to send this to all panelists and we will answer any questions that we see. So the first question we have is where can you find the infographic that we showed at the beginning? So there's two infographics that we have done. The first one that you saw which is the what have we accomplished in 2015. That one you can currently find on our notes page. And the one on how does a record get into ERIC, that one you can find on our FAQs page. And then the second question we've seen is how does ERIC define gray literature resources? And we define gray literature as not a journal. 
Um, so this would be a conference paper, a report, whether it's by a government or a think tank or a nonprofit. Um, it could be a, a wide variety of things, but generally just not a journal. So what is the current proportion of journal articles to other documents? At one point, it was 60-40. Is that still valid? So when I'm going to give you the information for 2015, but for 2015, uh, we don't have this here. Do We will pull this up as we are talking, and we will answer that question in a minute. But I would say that in general, um, it is around 60-40 is what we are aiming for. And we don't think about it as journals, non-journals, and that's one of the reasons why we don't have that number offhand. We're thinking it more as peer-reviewed versus not peer-reviewed content. So next question, are, are, are all articles indexed with the source terms by real people humans? Yes, they're humans with names and faces. Um, we find that they index better than machines. Um, so we've continued to rely on their expertise and have been very pleased with the fact that they can outperform machines regularly. What is the status of the documents that, was, that were removed to uh, personal information about the author? Um, so in 2013, we removed documents. We temporarily disabled all of our documents due to concerns about personally identifiable information, specifically social security numbers, appearing in a large but not overwhelming proportion of our documents. Those documents are generally, while they were occasionally about the author, they were not exclusively about the author. Um, those documents are not available online and there's not a plan to return them to be online um, in the near term. So those are just currently, um, we can't put them online. And if you look at our multimedia section of our website, what you can do is you can see a webinar that we gave on the PDF restoration process and some information and some slides there about what the problems on doing that are, why we can't blackline it, why we can't put up those documents in other ways, why I can't give you a list of those documents um, because we don't want to risk it giving out people's personally identifiable information. Um, will this webinar be available for review later? Yes, everyone who registered will be getting a link of this webinar when it is online. Um, we hope to have it online soon um, and we will let you know when it is available. Do we have other questions? Okay, we'll give it another two minutes for other questions. Um, and if you think of questions after this presentation or if you think your question will be best answered offline, please email us at the ERIC requests at ed.gov um, link that is on the slide show here. Um, this is also the same email at the contact us at the bottom of any ERIC screen and we can answer your questions that way. Okay. That looks like it's all of our questions. So thank you so much for attending this webinar. Please look for the slides and archive of this webinar to be posted in a few weeks at eric.ed.gov backslash question mark multimedia. Thank you.